Welcome to the Jongus Games questions and answers vlog for September 2022. Now, this was recorded live, but then I edited that down to what I thought were just the most interesting questions, and those are the ones that you're going to see today. Now, before we go into those, I would like to mention that if you prefer to listen to this episode instead of watch it, then you can gain access to an exclusive podcast feed by supporting this channel's Patreon campaign. That is at patreon.com slash Games, and there you can also gain access to other exclusive perks, like watching my exclusive opinions episodes. In those, I just about every week talk about all the games that I'm playing recently. Um, I go into the things I like and the things I don't like about them, and I repeatedly talk about games pretty much every single time I play them, so it's kind of an ongoing review of them. Uh, you'll also gain access to some videos early and advertisement-free by supporting that Patreon campaign. Now, the last thing to say is uh, if you have any questions you want to maybe add in to the overall questions you're going to see here today, or if you have any comments or answers of your own to some of the questions that are covered today, then please leave comments about those down below this video because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into those questions. Uh, let's start things off with Flavian. They say, congrats uh, for your participation in Hidden Gems. It was a pleasure to listen to. Any plans to participate in other podcasts? So yeah, I was a guest on Hidden Gems, which is a podcast that uh, really focuses on, uh, well, Hidden Gems, <laughs> I guess, uh, but uh, to a broader extent, uh, games that are generally overlooked um, or passed over or just kind of forgotten. So games that have, you know, high rankings, or I guess, you know, very large rankings, not low rankings on Board Game Geek. Um, it's a podcast I really enjoy listening to because they talk about a lot of games that I've never heard of before. And uh, when they found out I was a fan, they asked me to be a guest, and I said, sure. So yeah, it was really fun to uh, participate on that. Um, it's definitely interesting uh, reviewing something with another uh, group's criteria. You know, they uh, they have a numbering system, and I never did number systems when I made reviews. So it was it was it was a really fun time, honestly. Um, we talked for a lot longer than the uh, the actual running time that went out there. They did a decent amount of editing because uh, there was a, a few tangents that happened. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, as far as other podcasts I'm participating in, uh, none that I currently know of. Although it was funny over the course of like. Five days. I was a guest on the Heavy Cardboard podcast, and then I was a guest on Hidden Gems, and then uh, Nick and Anastasia and I recorded a uh, Friendly Ties podcast. Uh, so that was three podcasts that I was a part of over the course of five days. It was just like I went from not doing anything really with podcasts for a few months to just a whole bunch. Um, I enjoy podcasts a lot. I I like having. Uh, venues to ramble about games. So yeah, <laughs> I don't have any other uh, plans at the moment. Nobody else has reached out, but it's certainly possible. I, I definitely like being a guest. Uh, David C says, what are some of your favorite board games based on an IP? What IPs would you like to see in the future if anything is possible? Um, <laughs> I have to remember any games I like that are based on an IP. I mean, the uh, the Dune that came out like two or so years ago, uh, I like that one. It was kind of a worker placement deck building game. It wasn't my favorite game, but I played it a couple of times and I enjoyed that. Also, I just like Dune, the book. Uh, I like sci-fi themes in general. I haven't tried the Expanse board game, even though the Expanse is like one of my favorite pieces of fiction. I really should at some point just because I like those two things so much. Um, I, interestingly enough, I remember I played uh, the Witcher adventure game. Uh, I can't remember the exact name of it. It came out back in, I think, 2015 or so. And I played that before I knew anything about The Witcher. Uh, and it was fine. Like, I, I played it a couple of times. And then uh, subsequently, I watched the show. And then I read a bunch of the books. And it got me thinking, like, I'd really like to play that game again now that I actually know the characters. Because I feel like that might have uh, uh, brightened the game up as well. So that's not a great uh, answer to your question. Um, th there are some IPs that I'd like to see. I mean, honestly, I'd love to see more Expanse. There's that one board game. But I love the uh, the show. So, uh, and well, <laughs> I love the show, but I love the books more. So I'd love to see more things like that. Also for All Mankind, uh, that's a show that I love. Again, sci-fi, that's definitely my, uh, uh, my, my in my wheelhouse. And I think a For All Mankind board game could be a lot of fun. I would definitely uh, try that uh, regardless of what the uh, actual rules are. <laughs> Uh, Shorty Dancer says, question, comment really, I like your hair. <laughs> uh, I do too. Uh, I, I, this is really just a kind of a silly thing I decided to do because I've never done it before. Uh, this is about twice as long as my hair has ever been in my life. Uh, the, the last time it was long at all was when I was like 18 in high school and I was in a play. Uh, so it kind of made sense to go along with that play. Uh, but then, yeah, I've gone most of my life just keeping my hair short because I'm not a particularly fashionable person and it just keeps things simple. But then 
almost a year ago. I guess it was last November or December. Uh, it was kind of time for a haircut. And I was like, what if I just didn't? Like, let's just see what happens. So I don't think I necessarily look amazing with the haircut, but I think it's fun. And it's definitely a novelty that I'm still enjoying. And so far, people aren't like offended by it in the videos. That's part of the reason why um, I, I also got my haircut a whole bunch, especially early in the pandemic before vaccines and everything. I went and got my haircut at like an outdoor barber where we were all masked on like a patio and everything because it seemed like that was something I should do for the channel. In retrospect, I wish I'd just come up with this uh, idea earlier just to see, but either way, <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Flavian says, concerning IPs, an Elden Ring board game has been announced by the same company that made Dark Souls, uh, which... Uh, didn't get high praise. Yeah, I saw that. They sent me an email about it, just like a press release type of thing. Um, the video game Elden Ring is amazing. Uh, I haven't played it, but I am a big fan of Let's Plays. Uh, I'm, I really like watching good people play through video games. That way I can just like skip through the boss fights and not see all that kind of stuff and really experience the world and the story and everything. So I watched a full Let's Play of uh, of Elden Ring. It was like an 80 to 90 hour Let's Play. Uh, and obviously you could play that game for like 200 hours. But um, because of that, like I'm kind of interested. Like I, I felt like um, I got to know the world really well. I experienced like 80 hours of it. But, um, yeah, Dark Souls, the board game, wasn't really my favorite either. I didn't dislike it. Um, I thought the boss battle mechanic in the Dark Souls board game was pretty cool. Uh, but the rest of it, like fighting the just, like, basic minions and everything, that just didn't do a whole lot for me. So I would certainly try it because I did try the Dark Souls board game. But um, it doesn't seem like it's leaning towards my wheelhouse. Again, the thing I loved about Elden Ring was the world and the exploration and the wackadoodle story, which didn't really make sense, but I still enjoyed it for its uh, nonsensical nature. Uh, I mostly just fast forwarded through the let's play when any boss fights were happening. And that's kind of where these board games seem to be. Uh, let's see. At least says, hi, John, any games coming out of Essen that have you, that have piqued your interest? Uh, yeah, I haven't made a list because I'm not going to Essen this year. If I was, I would absolutely have a hit list <laughs> of all the games I want to get. But the things that jump off the top of my head are, uh, let's see, uh, Terra Nova, the, the kind of like streamlined Terra Mystica. I enjoy Terra Mystica. I enjoy Gaia Project. I'm really curious to see what a streamlined, more like 60-minute version of that game would be like. Um, as far as some others, there's uh, Transatlantic 2, which got a rename. It's called Crossing Oceans. Uh, very intrigued by that one. The new uh, Vladimir Suhi game, uh, Woodcraft. Um, I just, I'm always interested in every game that they design. Uh, and that one looks like it has some interesting mechanics going on there. Um, as far as other ones, there, there's there's got to be a bunch. I'm just really bad at rattling these things off of the top of my head. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Shorty Dancer says, question, the Friendly Ties podcast still going. I've listened to a few and really enjoy them. Yeah, 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 it, it absolutely is. In fact, uh, we put out an episode last week, and then we're going to be putting out another episode next week. Um, we, for a variety of boring reasons, went on essentially a like five to six month hiatus. Uh, we put out like one episode over the course of like five or six months because uh, life was happening. There were some logistics with some of the other hosts and everything. And it just, it didn't make sense to force it. Like it's, it's a strictly a hobby thing. I mean, sure I'm putting it up on John gets games, but you know, Anastasia's time is precious and Nick's time is precious and it just wasn't working out. But then um, we kind of caught a second wind essentially about a month ago. And we've recorded uh, let's see, I think three episodes over the last uh, month or so. And on top of that, we got a theme song, which is super exciting. Um, one of my oldest friends, actually my second oldest friend, uh, uh, somebody I became friends with in uh, college 20 years ago, um, is a musician. And he uh, reached out to me, uh, well, I guess us, about making a theme song for the show like 10 months ago. And we like worked on it a little bit with him like eight months ago. And then it just again, went on to hiatus like everything else. And we picked it back up again a couple of weeks ago and we came up with something that we all love. I I, I went to bed one night with a theme song stuck in my head because I listened to it so often. It's like eight seconds long. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm really excited about that. The next episode going out next week is going to be the first one that has that theme song. And again, we've recorded a bunch into the future. So now the idea is that um, with us kind of coming out of this hiatus and uh, being really enthused about it, we're planning on putting out episodes every two or so weeks have a decent amount of uh, lead time. So next week, we're putting out an episode all about the uh, WBC convention, the World Board Gaming Championship, which uh, Nick is uh, a really big fan of, and we just picked his brain and talked about that one for a while. We've also recorded one for 
Carnegie, as well as Sealand. So yeah, we have three more uh, that are gonna be coming out relatively soon. And who knows, maybe we'll record another one soon. We're, uh, we're definitely fired up and jazzed about it again. So I hope you enjoy them. <laughs> so they start to come out like every two or so weeks. Flavian says they have 220 hours of Elden Ring this year here. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like this enormous world that you can explore with the storyline. And the uh, Let's Play that I watched, um, it was uh, done by a Hearthstone streamer. So they were kind of trying to speed run through the story to get to the end so they could go back to doing Hearthstone streaming. Uh, but yeah, it, it was really it was really fun. Uh, Huntress Media asks, how do you find time to actually play games with friends, etc., when you have so many uh, and making very detailed, time-consuming videos? Well, I, the short answer to that is making the videos is my full-time job. <laughs> I, you know, Monday through Friday, I wake up, I make breakfast for me and Jess, and then I start work. And then I work until around six or so uh, in the afternoon. I walk the dog at some point in the afternoon usually. So, you know, making videos is my is my day job. It's the thing I do uh, for a living. And um, then, you know, as far as playing games is concerned, that almost always happens in the evenings. Um, you know, there's various game nights that I go to. Also, uh, I know quite a few people who enjoy playing uh, games online, like on Tabletop Simulator and uh, PCIO for... Um, playing cards that's called playingcards.io it's a it's kind of like tts but it's free and it's really oriented around playing card games which i've been playing a lot of recently um so yeah i just kind of schedule things in the evening is, is the, the short way to put it um i will say we have a mountain like literally a mountain stacked up of games on top of our uh calyx bookshelf uh that i've not played yet that are kind of like the games that i want to play and i've been having a hard time uh, making that mountain get smaller as opposed to steadily larger as more games come in. Um, honestly, though, over the last couple of weeks, I don't think a single box has arrived. So that's good. <laughs> there was like a crazy month uh, one or two months ago where it seemed like um, I was picking up boxes like every single day. Uh, David C. says, uh, if someone uh, made a John Cox character in a sci-fi style adventure game, what would your character power be? Huh. That's an interesting question. I'm trying to think of the things I usually like to do. I really like discounts. <laughs> I like getting discounts on things. I like, I like you know, making up incomes as well. But uh, if it was like an adventure game where you could like buy things from a market or do that kind of thing, I think a, uh, a John Cox uh, a special effect would be like buy anything for one or something like that. I, I think that could be cool. Or, you know, jump up, like buy anything for two or maybe even three if the market was like a price of one to like eight or nine. So if it's, you know, on the really cheap side, it's actually more expensive for my character. And if it's on the more expensive side, I could just go after those new things quicker. I That's my uh, my gut reaction feel. <laughs> I think that'd be fun. Uh, let's see. Elise says, you've made videos for Tylatum or uh, Tilatum. Man, I'm so bad with that name. Uh, and Terracotta Army. How would you compare the two? Which one do you prefer? Um, so yeah, I made videos for both of those. And unusually, I've played both of them. Um, I usually don't play games that I actually make videos for, but both Terracotta Army and Tilatum are games that I made videos for and I thought looked cool, and then I roped a friend in to play it with me. So I played both of them once, uh, funnily enough, both of them at uh, two players. And I think between the two, this is really tough. This is really tough. I think I would slightly lean towards Tilatum, not because it's a better game, just because I think it maybe plays to my interests a little bit more. Um, Terracotta Army is this incredibly thinky, super smart uh, worker placement game with a worker placement market that shifts every single round, and you can actually pay money to make it shift as well. And it's got this fascinating two-dimensional grid victory point puzzle thing. Um, I played it once with Anastasia. We both liked it. I think I liked it more than she did. And uh, it was just a really smart strategy game. And then with Teal Tomb, I played that one just a few days ago um, with the physical copy that I have. My friend Paul came over and I really enjoyed that one, but it's all about crazy pop-off turns. Uh, you know, in Terracotta Army, you put a worker down, you do three different things, um, you know, up to three things anyway, but you're usually doing three different things. And those things don't really chain off into other things. You're just trying to do like three strong things. Maybe it's a weak thing, a strong thing, and then a weak thing, but you're just trying to figure out the right thing for you in that moment. Whereas Deal the Tomb is this game that uh, ostensibly is just like, oh, 12 times in the game, you're going to draft a die. That die is going to give you some resources and it'll indicate some actions you can do. And the actions are just one type, like, oh, I'm just doing merchant actions to move my merchant along the map. 
or, oh, I'm just doing contract actions to pick up some contracts. And it seems like, oh, I'm barely going to do anything. I get 12 turns to take 12 dice and that's it in the game. But uh, right from the very beginning, you could, you know, do those merchant actions, move your merchant, pick up a bonus tile, use the, uh, the bonus tile to do architect actions. The architect moves over there. You pick up this tile. You can use that one right there to do some character actions, getting some characters. You could then put those on your board, getting you some bonuses, which might move your merchant again. Um, there's just a crazy chain of things that you can do in the game. And I like pop-off turns. And it seems like the overall design aesthetic of that game is all about having those. Uh, now, that being said, if somebody else is having a big pop-off turn, you're kind of waiting for them. So there is that to keep in mind. And again, I only played this one as two. Um, I will say that my impression after playing the two-player game was that it was fun, but I think I'd prefer it at three. Um, it would be longer. Um, the two-player game took two hours, including the teach. So I don't think that's too bad for a first play. Um, but I think th I'd enjoy three players more, even though it'd be a little bit longer, just because there's more tokens on the board. Um, and that just means there's more opportunities for these really big pop-off type turns. So yeah, I, I've enjoyed both of them. Um, I could see myself uh, certainly playing both of them again in the future, but a slight, uh, a slight lean towards uh, the, the Teela Tomb just because of the uh, mechanics and my preferences. All right, Justin Nichols says, I won a copy of On Mars from a podcast giveaway, uh, Man vs. Meeple. Oh, okay, cool. I genuinely didn't know they had a podcast. Cool. Uh, uh, you've been interested in trying a Lacerda game, but Dune Imperium is the most complex game that you've played by far. Uh, any recommendations for learning it? Um, hmm. There's a lot going on in On Mars. Uh, it's, in my opinion, not the most complicated of the Lacerda games, especially the heavy ones. I think it's actually my favorite of the heavy Lacerda games. Um, I think I would strongly recommend you watch a video. I've not made a video. People have asked in the past, but um, the publisher hasn't reached out to me and it just hasn't made sense uh, for me to like make a video with a friend's copy. Uh, so that hasn't happened just yet. But uh, I imagine there are good On Mars videos out there made by other people. And I think watching a video will definitely help all of these different ideas come together because that's just kind of a hallmark of Lacerda Designs. They have a lot of ideas that um, usually uh, come together in a very interesting way that works very well. But when you learn each one discreetly, it can be maybe hard to see how they're going to fold together, especially if you're not experienced with more complex games. So yeah, um, I would give that a go. Uh, d definitely watch a video. Hey, no pun included is here. Welcome, FK and Elaine. <laughs> Love a good theme song. Yeah, uh, so th that's a callback to the theme song we just put in for Friendly Ties. Um, honestly, things like theme songs and logos and everything, they make me really nervous. Like, I get a lot of anxiety about it because, you know, essentially a theme song is is an audio logo. <laughs> and uh, there was uh, quite an arduous, like, year-long process to get the logo done for uh, Junkies Games. Uh, and we haven't really figured out a logo for Friendly Ties. There's, it, right now, it's just this really simple thing I put together in, like, five minutes. We are going to come up with a good one. So it's kind of funny that we ended up going with our, like, audio logo before we did a physical logo. Um, I hope people enjoy it. I, I think it, it's a lot of fun. And it was also just great, you know, working with, you know, one of my oldest friends uh, to actually do it. I will say that that theme song for Friendly Ties got me so pumped that it got me thinking about a theme song for John Gets Games. I don't know. But again, like the moment I utter that out loud, I just get a huge anxiety <laughs> spike trying to figure it out. It's one of those things, uh, just like for, you know, uh, uh, the logos, the image logos, um, it's so easy to see something or hear something and be like, no, 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 I'm never going to find it. Nothing's good. And then you see slash hear the thing that actually works and you're like, hold on a second. That's great. Uh, I mean, that happened with uh, Friendly Ties, the podcast name. Uh, we were throwing around dozens of names and then Friendly Ties came up and it was like, hold on a second. There's something there, like just like a magic that you can't really uh, put your finger on. And uh, I definitely feel that strongly with the theme song that's coming out uh, for, for Friendly Ties. Um, I think uh, at this point, I'd like to shift over to a Patreon question. Um, the Patreon supporters of the channel get an opportunity to ask questions early. Um, then I just kind of inject them into the overall uh, live feed. So we're going to do this one, then go back to the chat. Um, so this one came from Scott Chrisley, and they said, are there any older games, uh, five to ten years old, that you have just discovered in the last one to two years and love? Uh, now, the short answer to this is, Yes, absolutely. There's tons. I did a very small amount of research and I came up with uh, six of them. And if you've been paying attention to my Patreon specific opinions episodes, you'll recognize all of these because I've been gushing about them for a while. Although on the main channel, the non Patreon exclusive stuff, maybe I'm not really. Um, the top one is Spectaculum. I made a uh, Playing With Friends uh, video uh, for that one with Anastasia just like a month ago or so. That came out in 2012. It is probably my favorite Cube Rails game. It's a Reiner Kinesia design with a little bit of randomness, and it is 
it's amazing. It, it, it's truly amazing. I play this game like 10 times now, and I, I'm looking forward to playing it more. Um, next up, we have Sealand. Uh, this is a game that came out in 2010, so it's 12 years old. Um, and I first learned about this one probably about eight months ago or so. Uh, I played it like four times. And as I mentioned earlier, we actually recorded a Friendly Ties episode about Sealand uh, specifically because uh, a week ago, I played it three times in the same week. Um, it, it's a brilliant game. It is so, so good, especially at two players. Uh, and we talk a lot about that on the Friendly Ties podcast, but that one is exceptional and it's 12 years old. Um, next up is Mask Men. Uh, this came out in 2014, so eight years old, uh, and it is a an oink game. It's a card game. It's a card shedding game with this really interesting idea of um, you have these Mexican luchadors and you have cards in your hand you're trying to get rid of, but they are just colors. The cards don't have values on them, and depending on how you play the cards down, that will dictate the relative value between like purple and gray and orange, and uh, you're just trying to get rid of your cards uh, before everybody else. I played that one a few times over the last month, and it's really impressed me. It is a super solid game that came out eight years ago. Um, Hellas came out in 2016. That's the newest one on this list. I guess this is Hellas 2016 because there's also a 2002 game called Hellas that's uh, completely different. Uh, Hellas 2016 is also a game I put out a playthrough with friends video of, also with Anastasia. Honestly, Anastasia is a big reason why I've been learning about a lot of these older games. She's really been deep diving in learning about, you know, hidden gem type games. Uh, she bought Hellas uh, and she bought Sealand. That's the reason I played both of those. And Hellas is just this totally brilliant uh, lead, follow, kind of work replacement game that has some shared incentives with this super wacky uh, uh, resource production engine. Um, honestly, watch my playthrough with the friends video. We, we teach it uh, at the very beginning so you can see how it plays. And uh, we had a lot of fun with that one. Uh, next up is Notre Dame. Um, that one came out in 2012, so it's 10 years old. Uh, and the only version of this that I played is the Anniversary Edition uh, that came out, I guess, earlier this year, or maybe it came out in 2011. Either way, it's about 10 years old. The Steffenfeld game, I had heard about it, so maybe this one's a little bit of a cheat. It's not like I just learned about this in the last two, one to two years, but it was kind of like I knew it existed, but I n knew nothing about it. Um, I got it on sale from like a miniature market sale or something like that, and I played it a few times, and it is a super smart um, uh, action draft crafting game with some really fresh ideas that I really don't feel like I've seen before, um, even though the game is 10 years old. Um, the final one um, that I'll talk about right now is Oasis. I learned about this one on that Hidden Gems podcast. They covered this one. It came out in 2004, and it's an Alan Moon design, the same designer as Ticket to Ride. Um, and this came out only just a couple of years after Ticket to Ride. Um, Oasis is a really interesting game where you have... It's been like a month or so since I played it, but you have sort of shared incentives as you're building out this board. Um, the shared incentives aren't on the board. There's just kind of area acquisition for points. But you have these cards that are put out into buckets, essentially, and people are going to be uh, taking these cards, kind of drafting them around the table based off of certain situations. Um, I don't remember the specifics enough. I talked about it a couple of times in my uh, exclusive opinions episodes, uh, but I, I just remember that one being quite cool. The um, artistic aesthetic of it is, is not great. It, it's not a super pretty looking game, but it's been a lot of fun. Uh, Elise says, some Essen releases I'm hoping to find are The Wolves, Kites, Turing Machine, Rise, Come Together, and Orlake. Yes, Orlake looks super cool. That's one I totally forgot about. Um, this one, uh, it's getting U.S. distribution, I think, through Pandasaurus Games. Um, there was a video that went up on BGG just a couple of days ago of somebody kind of demoing the game. They kind of taught it, and then they played through a few rounds. And I am super in. This game looks right down my alley. It's relatively lightweight, I will say. It's probably about 60 minutes. But it has... Um, uh, pool drafting from like a sliding market row, and it's got some kind of uh, uh, territory building. You're going to be taking the tiles from the draft. Essentially, these tiles come out on the draft, and you randomly put other tiles down on top of them of different sizes, and then the card has an action on it. So on your turn, you're going to pick one of these options from this sliding row, and that will dictate the tile that you can place. And again, the tile was randomly put there, but the size was dictated by the card. And then the card itself has that action, and then you activate the action, and the effectiveness of that action will depend on the various things that you've done already. It might say, you know, uh, produce or lock a ore. In that case, you find all your mines and you get one ore for each one of those things. Um, there's there's other ones like training camps to make uh, hoplites. Um, there's creatures that you have to fight. There is dice rolling to uh, evaluate this. And I was a little worried about that at first. But it seems like there's a lot of smart ideas 
to kind of get around that. Like, it seems like it's uh, better than um, Oracle of Delphi, which also has die rolling to defeat monsters. In this one, there's a D6, and one of the six sides is just an auto win, uh, and there is no auto lose. And then in order to defeat a monster, it might have like a power of like five. Um, you need to either roll a skull or get five or more with your dice. You automatically roll one die, but then for every hoplite you spend, um, you can roll another die. And here's the thing. If you spend like, you know, one hoplite, so you roll two dice and you miss, so you don't get a skull and you don't get the right numbers, you leave the hoplite there. And the next time you do this action to fight that monster, that hoplite is still there and you get to roll an extra die for it. So it's still unfortunate if you miss, like there is randomness with the dice, but at least on the backswing of that bad luck, the next time you fight it, you have even more odds to uh, to defeat it and you get to reuse that hoplite essentially to try and make that happen. Um, it's got some other things going on, but yeah, that game really piqued my interest. I, I don't know if it's going to be like my favorite game of the year. I might be overly excited about it, but it looks like a really streamlined, interesting uh, game that, that I'm very much wanting to try. The other ones that you mentioned, uh, Rise looks cool, but I know nothing else about it except for it's a Capstone Games release. It's a heavy-ish weight Euro game with a whole bunch of tracks. That's literally all I know, and I, I tend to like those games, so I'm, I'm quite curious to learn more. Turing Machine looks cool. I've watched some videos on that one, um, and I still have no idea how it works. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, definitely some cool stuff coming out for sure. Uh, Flavian has some other Essen uh, releases. They say, here for Essen, very hyped for Ready, Set, Bet, which is a real-time horse racing betting game by John D. Clare, and curious about Violet and the Grumpy Niece, an asymmetric two-player trick-taking game, if I understand BGG well. I've never even heard of that second one. I I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up later on. <laughs> that does sound cool. Uh, Ready, Set, Bet, I, I watched a video about this one. It looked kind of neat. I'm not crazy about real-time games, I'll admit. Um, so I think it's probably a really good game, but maybe not necessarily for me. I'd try it, but it's not one that I think I'm going to be rushing out to try. All right, next up, uh, Reishi says, knowing you are not a big expansion guy, do you plan on getting the Ark Nova expansion? Yeah, that's totally happening. <laughs> Ark Nova is so good. Um, I... <sighs> I played it, I think, 14 times now, and from what I've learned about the expansion, it just looks like it's right up my alley. Um, I like expansions where you just shuffle more cards into a big deck, um, and you do that. I, I know a lot of people don't like how large the deck is. One of those people is my wife, Jessica, and, and she loves Ark Nova, but um, her biggest issue with the game, or realistically maybe her only issue with the game, is that enormous draw deck and the luck of the draw that comes from it. Uh, I don't mind it personally, and so I'm just like, more the merrier. Throw more cards in there, especially because I think the new cards that get added in have a wave-type mechanic, or at least some of them do, to try and flush through cards quicker, to try and make up for the fact that the deck is just going to be larger. Um, there's some other things going on in the expansion. I don't remember the specifics, but they all sound cool. Um, the thing about expansions is I frequently don't like them because I frequently will play a game like two to four times and then get an expansion and then never play it again um, because I didn't really kind of get into the base game enough to really, I don't know, see everything that's there. And then I have this expansion, which adds in extra rules and it just makes it hard. Ark Nova, I feel like is going to be an exception because I've played this game, I think, 14 times. It's one of the best games to come out, um, honestly, in like the last 10 years. It's a very, very good game. And, and I've played it so many times that it's kind of like ingrained in my brain now. So I don't think I'm going to have that extra... Um, anxiety and uh, uh, worry about teaching the game along with an extra expansion. And so many of the people I play this game with have already played it, so that would not be as much of an issue. It's like, okay, we all know Ark Nova. Now let's talk about what the expansion brings in. So I think it's going to be, uh, like, yeah, it's, it's one of the rare expansions that I'm actively excited about. Not necessarily because Ark Nova needs it, but just because the game's amazing and I like to add more stuff. Uh, I bought the two... Uh, extra board promo pack thing that Capstone put out there. And the last time I played it was like two weeks ago and I played with one of them and another player played with the other one. So I kind of got to see both of them in action and they were fun. Um, I played the one that's kind of oriented towards continents, uh, trying to put specific animals from specific continents onto specific parts of your board. Um, there's threads on PGG saying pe some people think it's maybe underpowered. I thought it was fun. It was a really cool puzzle and I was this close to winning. It was a crazy close game. I think my score was like 14 to 15. 15, Jessica won with 15, and then the third player who had the other expansion board had a score of like 11. So it was one of the tightest games of Ark Nova I've ever seen. Uh, let's see. Reishi says, have you ever been interested in legacy type games? Yeah, totally. Um, Pandemic Legacy 1 and 2 are two of my favorite games. Uh, they're amazing. For a while, I think I had Pandemic Legacy uh, 
season one anyway as my favorite game. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. It was definitely my favorite game the year that one came out. Um, I really enjoy legacy type experiences when it makes sense to actually dedicate to it. Uh, again, we finished season one, we finished season two. We half finished uh, season zero, which is the third one that came out. That one, for a variety of reasons, didn't click with us as much. I mean, we played it like seven or eight times, uh, but then we just kind of put it down. We weren't interested in finishing it, whereas we both really, uh, Jessica and I, uh, and some friends, uh, really enjoyed the first two seasons. Um, I played like 30 uh, sessions of Gloomhaven, which is kind of like a legacy game, although I would argue it's, I guess, more like a campaign game, although you're kind of splitting hairs at that point. Yeah, I like legacy games. They could just be tough uh, because you have to get the same people together and, you know, playing a game that many times can be tough. Uh, I played The King's Dilemma on TTS with the same group of five people, but part of that was because we just had a standing uh, Wednesday night uh, uh, date for it uh, for like a couple of months. It was just like most Wednesdays, the five of us got together and we played The King's Dilemma until we finished it. And that took like 17 sessions. Uh, so another one is uh, The Queen's... Uh, <laughs> Queensdale, the rise of Queensdale. There we go. Um, that's a legacy dice game where you can put stickers on dice. Uh, we had a group together for that one and we played that one like seven or eight times and then all decided we were kind of done with it. We were kind of for, for a long uh, set of reasons, we didn't want to keep playing it, but we just sat down and spent like an hour and we pretended to go through the rest of the campaign to see all of the other wacky stuff that got added in. Um, again, we had to kind of dedicate time for that. And most of the people in that play were also in that King's Dilemma uh, legacy session. So we kind of went from one into the other. Uh, but yeah, in general, I'm not really focusing on legacy games anymore, mostly because it's hard to actually get to the end of them. Uh, Bartolis says, do you overall prefer playing board games, in quote, board, uh, with the board and pieces, etc., card-only games, or, or, uh, or role-playing games, like games with less components and more talking and interaction? Um, my personal preferences are the first two pretty much equally and next to no interest in the third one. Um, I love board games. I love card games. Honestly, I kind of lump them together. I've been going uh, pretty crazy on card games over the last two months or so, and Teach You is a game I've loved for like, you know, 10 plus years. Um, but I don't really parse it to the point where like, oh, well, Teach You is a card game and that's totally different from a board game. In my experience, the mental decisions and the mental space that I go into when playing a cards only game versus a board game is pretty similar. Now, when it comes to role playing games, that mental space is very different and it's just not something that really jives with my brain. I've tried to do uh, RPGs a couple of times. I have some friends that are very, very, very into RPGs, like playing multiple different RPG session things, campaigns, uh, systems. I, I, again, I'm not really experienced with these things, but they would play multiple of them at the same time, you know, going weeks and weeks and months and months long. And that's awesome. Um, I played a Star Wars one. I can't remember even what it was called, but it was like six or seven years ago. And I participated in like four or five sessions of it. Um, I really tried to give it a go. Like at that point I was like, I don't really like role-playing games, but some of my favorite people on this planet are doing this and they invited me to try it. So let's go. Like, you know, if I'm ever going to enjoy it, it's going to be with these people. And it was fine. Uh, from what I could tell, unfortunately, I, I turned into a quote unquote murder hobo, which is a term I've heard about, uh, uh, uh role-playing games in general, where you just kind of like go from one town to the next, murdering people like crazy, just, you know, using your weapons to kill things and not really negotiating and not really doing other creative things. I was like a, a droid with a cool gun and every in every situation, it was just like, well, we could just shoot that or we could just shoot this. And, and also it just felt like this gravitation towards rolling the shoot stuff dice because that's all my character really did. They were a droid who were, was really good at shooting things. Um, so anyway, uh, it's not like um, I was fired from that group or anything. I chose to, uh, to leave it because I think they were just... Um, Really, there were a lot better at role-playing games. Like, I was certainly new to it. And it wasn't really grabbing me in a way that made sense. I was enjoying it because I was with my favorite people. I wasn't really enjoying it because of the game systems. So, yeah, I'm not necessarily an omni-gamer. Um, talking, interacting, uh, especially, like, social deduction type games and also just coming up with ideas on the spot, being creative, not really my wheelhouse. <laughs> I like games with really strict rules that tell you exactly what you can and can't do and then try to do the best from within those rules. Uh, no pun included, says, you should totally have a theme song for JGG. I should. Honestly, Jessica, uh, like seven or eight years ago, um, uh, felt strongly about this too. Uh, she came up with a few ideas, just finding like clips on uh, royalty-free websites. But I, I just bounced off of it from the anxiety of it and just, I don't know, I, I just wasn't in a space for it. Um, but maybe I am now? We'll see. <laughs> I've been doing this for like eight and a half years and every video is just, you know, me starting looking at the camera saying... 
welcome to John Gets Games. It's just something I've always done, so I'm not even sure how I'd work an intro video slash theme song in. I don't know. Never say never. It's it's a stronger possibility now than ever has been in the past. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, at this point, I want to shift over to the other Patreon question that was sent, uh, funnily from uh, Flavian, who I think is also in the chat right now. But anyway, we're going to get to this question as well before we go back to the chat. Uh, once again, these questions uh, were posted from uh, Patreon supporters of the channel. Uh, so Flavian asked, uh, is there a game you deeply loved and that today you don't really want to play anymore? Maybe because you either played it too much or just because of a change of taste. Um, I have an answer to this one, and it's it's not a perfect answer. Uh, the answer to this one is through the ages. Um, for a long time, for like years and years and years, I, I was of the opinion that this was my favorite game. And I remember when I did my top 20 list back in like 2015? 14, something like that. Um, this was my number one game. And I think I said something along the lines of, and I never see that changing, which is kind of hyperbolic because of course everything changes over time. The thing about Through the Ages is I played the first version of it like a couple dozen times. And then I played the new story, the kind of revamped, honestly much better version of it, like another dozen or so times, like 12 to 15 times on that one. And this is a game that usually takes three to four hours to play uh, when you're playing real time with people around the table. But um, the quote unquote issue that I had with this is uh, most of those games were played online asynchronously using a website called, I think, boardgaming.net or something like that. It was a really good implementation to play through the ages with your friends asynchronously using any browser and whatnot. And I feel like I might have kind of overplayed the game even specifically in that kind of uh, environment where games weren't taking three to four hours. They were taking three to four weeks uh, because of that. And I became obsessed with these games. Uh, some of my friends did as well. Uh, there was, uh, we were always playing four player games, but there was like six of us who did this. So, um, you know, every game, like two people would kind of sit out. So we weren't in every game, but if we were sitting out, we would still actively follow the game that was happening from the other friends. You know, what would I do in the situation chatting? Like, you know, are you going to take uh, Napoleon or what do you think about this or all oh, that monarchy's really, uh, you know, interesting for your situation and trying to come up with all these plans, parsing the probabilities of when certain cards are going to come out. Um, it allowed me to AP my turns for like 12 hours. And I feel like that was maybe a mistake. <laughs> I feel like maybe I kind of overused that part of my brain, the through the ages part of my brain to the point now where I haven't played it in a few years and I, I don't find myself like running to it. Like I'm playing a lot of other games instead um, of similar ish weights. Again, you know, three to four hours is a pretty decent play time. Uh, but here's the thing through the ages, a new story in particular is brilliant. It is one of the best board games ever made. Uh, and I actually just a few weeks ago bought the expansion to it that came out a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Um, I bought it because I was buying something else and I saw it there and I figured I should get it now before it potentially goes out of print and then the expansion's like $100 or something, you know, a few years in the future. And I am hoping to play this one more specifically with those expansion characters. So th that's why this is kind of a cheat. Uh, this is a game that I used to deeply love. And it's not that I don't want to play it anymore. It's just that looking at the fact that I haven't played it in like four years, that kind of tells me that I, I'm not wanting to play it more than other games. So I am hoping to come back to it uh, because it is a really good game. I, I will also say that some of the people that I could potentially play this with um, have also played like hundreds of games of this on the iOS app. There's a really solid iOS app. Um, I bought that app. I played like two or three games against the AIs. I just have so little interest in playing games against not people. I just It just did not engage with me to play against a computer. So I'm a little worried, like next time I play this one, it's probably with people who play this game like almost daily against the AI, which is also a little intimidating. But either way, that, that's a long uh, story for Through the Ages. It, it's, it's really great. Honestly, talking about it right now kind of makes me want to play it again. But also at the same time, I've played uh, Nations once or twice since the last time I played Through the Ages. And I've only played Nations like five or six times, but I, I can't help but find myself feeling like maybe I'd rather bring nations off the shelf instead of through the ages more often than not these days because it's quicker. Honestly, it's not as mean. That's another aspect to it where, you know, the first, you know, dozen or two <laughs> games of through the ages, we were exploring the systems and you know, potentially rolling over somebody with the military. But it seemed like, especially with the group think from our group, military is so incredibly important. And the game almost became this incredibly stressful posturing situation, trying to get your military up to the point where you're not the weakest, you're actually, you know, one of the strongest. And then that stress was just really stressful, especially if it's like a three to four week game. So again, coming back to like three to four hours, a much 
or down with playing it in that environment. In fact, I think I never want to play this asynchronously again because of the weeks long stress of those longer games. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of talking myself back into it, but I, I will say that, you know, it's a mean game, especially when you play with people who know what they're doing. It can be an incredibly mean game where you're setting up all these engines, you're doing all these cool things. And then in the last 25%, you just get rolled over by wars because you were unable to get enough military to be in a position to actually stop that. Whereas nations, you know, the wars, they can hurt more people, some people more than others, but it's kind of a universal hitting kind of thing. It's, it's a much less mean. Anyway, that was a long answer to your question, but hopefully it was interesting. <laughs> okay. Coming back to the chat, uh, Flavian is here. <laughs> like I said, so two questions from Flavian. Um, do you play, uh, in silence or do you play music in the background of the game? Like when I'm actually filming my videos? Actually, are you talking about videos or when I'm playing games with other people? Maybe even thematic playlists for some games. It sounds like you're playing, you're talking about playing uh, with other people. 99% um, of the time, we don't have music happening um, in a game. It's just something that I honestly don't even think about. Uh, I certainly would not want to have music that would be distracting. Um, I will say when it comes to recording games, there was a few years there where I recorded while listening to music. So I had earbuds in listening to like really low volume, like ambient music, like Sega Ross or Tycho or, um, uh, oh my gosh, Ulrich Schnauss. That's what it was. Uh, I just, you know, I, I would do that. Like I remember the Gloomhaven video, which took a very long time to record. I was listening to ambient music that entire time, like really low so that the microphone wouldn't catch it. Um, that being said, these days I listen to so much music when I'm just at my computer editing. If the camera isn't on in the studio, I'm probably listening to music. So it's almost to the point where it's kind of good not to be listening to music when I'm recording videos these days. So anyway, like I said, I love music. I listen to it all the time. And maybe that's part of the reason why I don't play music when we're actually playing games because music is such a integral part of my job, like, you know, during the work day that it just doesn't even occur to me. Wayne says, I love having music, uh, background music while playing as it raises the energy of the room and fills in some of the silence between turns. Yeah, I, I, that makes sense. You know, definitely, you know, especially party type atmospheres, having a little bit of music in the background is a good thing. I am certainly not against it. Um, I feel like music in the background makes a little more sense when you have like and people at a game night, like when two or three games are happening simultaneously versus just, you know, like one game that's happening at that moment. Um, that being said, again, um, I just forget <laughs> that it's even an option. Uh, the last time we played something here, oh no, it wasn't here. It was at a friend's house. We played Ark Nova. Yeah, that's right. We played Ark Nova just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, one of the friends I played with um, got out their phone and put on like a, 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 a animals oriented playlist, uh, which was nice. We just had that kind of uh, rolling in the background while we played the game. It was fine until this one song came on that wasn't really a song. It was just like really annoying monkeys screeching or something like that. We're like, OK, I'm having a hard time concentrating on the game. Uh, Jinrei says, question, is it an apt comparison that through the ages might be the next step up for people that like Anno 1800, but want an, uh, want a heavier experience? That is interesting. I haven't really thought about it that way. I mean, both of these games are card, sort of card based um, engine builders, but th there's a lot more engine building in through the ages. I mean, I'm not going to say it's not an apt comparison, but I will say that they are significantly different games. Um, you know, uh, Anno 1800 is all about, you know, that puzzle of trying to figure out how to race through these cards that you have in your hand, usually while getting points from other things, whereas uh, Through the Ages is incredibly strategic. I mean, I guess there's the strategy of Anno, like you get a card in your very, your opening hand and you're like, I'm going to maybe finish this on my last turn of the game and you have to work towards it. Um, so maybe there's some comparisons, but the, here's the thing. You never use your opponent's stuff in Through the Ages. So if that is the thing that you really like about Anno 1800, like that kind of economy that's happening for all the players on the table, that's going to be totally gone. Um, Through the Ages is much more about that uh, drafting row and like hate drafting things away from your opponents um, while also mostly focusing on taking things that are the best, best thing for you. I guess hate drafting happens somewhat rarely. It's a bigger thing of being worried somebody else might take the thing. Like it's almost like a push your luck game with through the ages where there could be a card that's just amazing for you, but it costs three civil actions, which is enormous. That can practically be your whole turn. So do you take it now so that you have it or do you kind of push your luck and hope it goes around the table so that now it's cheaper? It's like two or maybe even one civil action to take on your next turn. Um, that's much more the mindset that I'm frequently in versus like, okay, how do I do this one thing based off of what everybody else has done around the table? Um, so I'm not going to say they are super dissimilar, but, um, yeah, they're, they're definitely different games. Um, certainly, um, through the ages is a heavier experience. So, uh, yeah, maybe give it a try. <laughs> I'm not really sure where I land with that one. 
Uh, Jeremy says, what is your experience or thoughts about uh, living card games like Marvel Champions or Lord of the Rings? I recently got sucked down the Champions rabbit hole and uh, that hole is deep and it's only getting deeper. Uh, my short answer to this one is I've never really participated in a living card game. The only one that I can think of that I owned was I think the first one or one of the first ones. It was Warhammer something. I can't remember the name of it. It came out in like 2012 or so. Invasion, Warhammer Invasion, that's right. Um, I bought the starter kit for that one mostly because I thought the game itself, like the mechanics of it looked super cool. And I literally never bought any expansions for it. Uh, I played it a few times with a few different people. I enjoyed it. And if I had started to buy some of those living card game expansions, maybe that would have helped. But I'm not really a lifestyle game type of person. And these living card games is kind of like in the name living. Um, they're very much oriented around lifestyle type gamers, like people who say, you know, this is the game I want to play like every single week with the same people um, trying out new strategies as new expansions come in and whatnot. So I personally haven't really experienced the living card game system. Um, I will say that I was obsessed with a big capital O uh, with uh, Magic the Gathering back in 2000 and no, <laughs> back in 1998. It's so easy to just say 2000 before everything, but no, before the 2000s in 1998, um, uh, my freshman and sophomore year of high school, actually junior year as well, for a few years in high school, I was obsessed with Magic the Gathering, uh, which is a collectible card game, not a living card game. So I know that part of me can really enjoy that. But here's the thing. Um, I've mentioned this a few times on the, uh, you know, in Q and A's and whatnot before. Um, I love Hearthstone, which is, it's a collectible card game, but it's it's kind of living card game adjacent. And uh, it's an electronic card game that I never play. I just watch other people play. And I, I literally watch Hearthstone every single morning. I watched uh, Brian Kibler a couple episodes uh, that he put out this morning. Um, so, like, that's just part of my day. And so I feel like I am able to get that living card game slash, you know, uh, collectible card game itch scratched every single morning when I watch breakfast by watching other people play Hearthstone very well. And then I can kind of move on with my day and not feel the need to actually do those things myself. Again, it's not a living card game. I, I understand that, but there's definitely some adjacencies. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a living card game, Hearthstone that is, because the people that I watch are full-time professional Hearthstone streamers slash content creators. So they get every card. So every time an expansion set comes out, you know, they spend probably a couple hundred dollars so that they get literally every single card in that set so that they can use all of them. So as far as I'm concerned, I spend no money. I watch their videos and effectively have access to all of the new stuff. So that is a very long answer that kind of meandered around, but that, that's essentially where I land these days. I'm just not interested in actually participating in a living card game or just any kind of lifestyle game. You know, going back to the legacy question earlier, um, I just prefer to play lots of different games uh, as opposed to playing like the same game over and over again, at least because the game is incentivizing my, me to. Obviously, I played a whole bunch of things like Ark Nova and I played Sealand three times in one week, um, you know, just a, a week ago. Uh, so that can happen, like playing the same game over and over again. But I prefer to do that when I just have a active zeal to experience the game more as opposed to the game's mechanics, you know, kind of pushing that. That was a way longer answer to that question than I thought I was going to have. <laughs> Uh, Booch says, question, have you ever tried an 18xx game? If so, what did you think of it? That is quite a question. Uh, yes, uh, I have played, I think, four or five of them now. Uh, let's see, I played 1867. I've played 18 EU with the drafting variant. I played 18 Chesapeake and 1889. Shikoku? Yeah, I'm pretty sure those are the numbers. So I think I've played four 18xx games at this point. Um, the short answer is I like them. The uh, medium answer is I like them, but I don't think I'm ever going to own any of them, and I don't really find myself pushing for them. Uh, I would definitely like to play more of them in the future, maybe specifically in like convention type settings, because they do take a long time to play. But in general, you know, 99 times out of 100, I would rather play like two to three Cube Rails games in the same amount of time as an 18xx game. Um, but, you know, if there's a bunch of people who want to play an 18xx game, especially one that I haven't played, because again, I like that variety, um, I can certainly see myself playing more of these in the future. I don't think I'm going to be stopping at four. But again, I don't think I'm going to be buying any. I played 1889 when there was a Kickstarter going. I played it on Tabletop Simulator, and I specifically played it to see if I wanted to buy it, if I wanted this to be like my one 18xx game, because from what I heard, it was, you know, simpler than a lot of other ones, and it was quicker than a lot of other ones. But it still took like three to four hours. It still has a lot of things going on. I don't know. It's not, they're not the most complicated games to teach, but they're so complex with their interactions. I just decided, I think I'll play other people's 18xx games 
when it makes sense, I don't think I need to add one to my collection. Uh, so I'm never essentially pushing for it, but more might happen. I will say that I, uh, when I played 1867, I talked about it at length, at great length, um, in an impressions vlog that was not a uh, exclusive. So if you search John Gets Games 1867 impressions or something like that into Google, you should be able to find it. And I talk about it for quite some time. Uh, that was my first 18xx game. Honestly, I played that before I played any Cube Rails games. So it was really my first time getting into this whole stocks and trains and dividends and and uh, all those different ideas. So uh, definitely check that one out. Um, I talked about 1889. Uh, in a lot of detail as well, but that was in a Patreon exclusive opinions episode. Uh, most of the supporters of this channel through Patreon um, get access to these uh, podcasts slash vlogs where I talk about all the games that I'm playing recently. So yeah, if I played it in the last year or so, it's it's talked about at great length in one of those exclusive episodes. Uh, Wayner says, question, the political part of Twilight Imperium is my favorite part of the game. Are there any board games that have a similar feel as the whole game? Huh, that's an interesting question. I have played Twilight Imperium three once and four 1.25 times or so. And the last time I played TI4 was probably three or four years ago, um, maybe three years ago. It's been a long time uh, since I played this one. I'm trying to think. I mean, I will say The King's Dilemma is all about negotiations. I mean, it, it, it's a much simpler game. It's also a legacy type game, but it, it's literally a game of negotiations. That's like 90% of what you do. So if you enjoy negotiating for various different things, especially if there's a narrative through, a uh, flow through all of those uh, negotiations from a, a legacy perspective, I would highly recommend that. I know there's a new one coming out on Kickstarter soon called The Queen's Dilemma. That's literally all I know about it. Maybe it'll be better. Maybe it'll be worse. I don't know. But um, maybe keep your eye out for that and see what that Kickstarter is like. There's probably other games that I'm just totally blanking on, but that's that's the only one that really comes to mind right now. Uh, Matthew says, do you like board game style games like Kemet or Root? If so, which do you prefer? Um, I've essentially never played Root, um, essentially because I played it on my phone once with my opponents and I had no idea what was going on. So I effectively feel like I've never played Root. Um, Kemet is fun. I played the, the first edition like three or four times and I liked it, but I ultimately got rid of it because again, I don't really play troops on a map types games that often. It's not really my, my wheelhouse. I am curious to try the new version. I've heard a lot of good things about it. I would certainly like to try, but honestly, I'm just not really into war type games. Uh, troops on a map, moving them around. Uh, I'm not against it. Like it's not like I veto those games, but I essentially never go out of my way to buy them and I never go out of my way to play them. Uh, who knows? Maybe in a year or two, I'll suddenly have this uh, renaissance and, and figure, find that the only thing I want to do is play war games. But at this point, I think that's somewhat unlikely. All right, one last question. I think this is the last question um, from Flavian. They say, how are you these last few weeks since the last Q&A? Uh, so the last Q&A that I did was in June. Um, I accidentally just skipped over the one in July. Like I literally was thinking like, oh, that Q&A should be coming up soon. I looked at my calendar and realized I had scheduled it for five days prior. Oops. <laughs> and then I just was so busy. I just didn't schedule it. Uh, and then for uh, the next month, August, uh, I had one scheduled and then we did some traveling and the traveling, the plans changed. It overlapped with it. And again, I just never got around to rescheduling it. So it's been like three months since I'd done one of these. So quite a few weeks. Um, the short answer is by and large, I've been doing well. I mean, I have ups and downs for sure. Um, but uh, I've been playing a lot of fun games. You know, if you've been paying attention to any of my exclusive uh, Patreon uh, opinion episodes, I've been going down this card games rabbit hole, which has been a lot of fun to really dig into a lot of esoteric Japanese card games and also just to be able to play Teach You again for the first time in years. And I've played it a few times over the last month. So as far as gaming is concerned, um, things have been going uh, very well. Uh, but yeah, as far as everything else is concerned, um, things have been going well. Uh, we did a, a trip last month. We were gone for a week to see my family and to see a whole bunch of friends. So that was great as well. Um, there's probably going to be some uh, trips uh, happening before the end of the year. So yeah, things are definitely looking up. Thanks for the question. Um, also, thanks to uh, everybody for joining in with the uh, live stream here uh, and also for watching it later on. I'm going to edit this up and post it later on. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm really glad to do one of these again. Uh, part of me was worried that after missing a couple of months that I would just kind of never get back to it, but I really do enjoy making these. Honestly, these videos are one of my favorite videos that I do um, within each given month. I, I did a live uh, podcast um, a guest 
thing with heavy cardboard uh, a week or two ago, and it kind of reminded me how much fun it can be to do things live. So that was definitely a kick in the pants to be like, you should do this more. So uh, I'm really glad that I did. Uh, I will very likely do another one of these next October. Um, I'll figure out the timing of it when it actually makes sense. And yeah, thanks again uh, for joining in. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.